It's 10 minutes after the hour. I'm Steve Reinhardt. I'm your host. I appreciate Brian filling in for me there for just a minute. I got into the studio just a second late. I was pulled over by the Utah Highway Patrol for not having trailer lights. <laughs> so I was towing a boat. Anyway, always nice to be with you, our listeners, for this brief one-hour period of time here on Utah's oldest continually broadcasting radio program. KTOC's been around since 1965 and is the third oldest talk radio station in the entire United States of America. We're going to get into some issues of culture, history, politics, and religion a little later on. As we do often on this show, we try to schedule interviews with interesting guests and bring you perspective on news and things going on in the world that you might not get from the larger networks. Today is no different. If you listen to the show, I think three weeks ago, we had on Larry Scott, who won Mr. Universe competition in 1964-1965. He lives here in Kaysville, Utah, only a couple of miles away from me, and is mentioned in Arnold Schwarzenegger's biography several times. Him and Schwarzenegger were friends. He now owns a supplement company <laughs> and teaches fitness. At any rate, I got a few emails from listeners after that interview who wanted to get a hold of him and thought it was interesting. And I wanted to bring you another guest today who maybe can shed more light on the world of bodybuilding. But Larry mentioned when he was on the air that he had taken steroids when he won the Mr. Universe competition. And a question that I have and that a lot of our listeners have is how common is steroid use? How prevalent is it in not just the bodybuilding world, but the Olympics, professional sports, and the authority on this subject seems to be Bill Llewellyn. <laughs> he wrote a book, which I have, called Anabolics, which I think is a bestseller. I don't know how many copies he's sold in print or electronically, but the people that I know in the bodybuilding world believe that this book is authoritative, that it is the best book out there for information on steroids. Now, steroids are not something that I take. I don't know anybody that does. But they are taken commonly by professional athletes, bodybuilders, and these other people. Bill, I've seen a, a few of his videos on YouTube, and, and he certainly knows his stuff from having read his book. I want to go to Bill now. Bill, I appreciate you being with us. You're on the air. Well, thanks for having me on. It's so kind of you to come on on such short notice, and we've never actually uh, had a discussion with each other. <laughs> and no. so... It, Pleasure to meet you. Well, I have your book. I enjoy it, and I try to hit the gym every day myself a little bit. Never taken steroids, but I know that they're, that they're so common in the bodybuilding world. They're not something that people talk about. The people that are on them don't discuss them. You seem to know everything there is to know about them, and I thought our, our listeners would enjoy learning about this. I, I want to begin with just a little bit of your history how did you get interested in bodybuilding or anabolic steroids to begin with and become inspired to write this book that you wrote? Sure. Um, well, first with, with bodybuilding and, uh, and eventually uh, steroids, uh, I was still at a young age. It was really because I was, uh, you know, I think like a lot of people, I was a skinny kid. Um, you know, I was starting to go to the gym. I saw a lot of, you know, people around me that were, you know, putting on muscle and getting popular and, you know, it just, um, you know, I was in a different social circle at the time. I was a skinny, computer nerdy kind of kid, and, you know, I just, like, kind of wanted to break out and, uh, you know, and change, you know, change my appearance, change the way things were, were going for me as a, you know, as a young man. So I started working out, and... And, and where did you grow up? Were you in New York? Yeah, Long Island, yeah. Okay. And, you know, so I started working out, but, you know, I'm, I'm a skinny person. My genetics are... On one side, I'd like to say I'm, I'm blessed in that I, I've always stayed lean, but that's not the kind of genetics that work well with somebody that wants to bodybuild and, and put on muscle. It was a real, you know, real fight for me. So after some time <clears throat> seeing, you know, people and friends around me making such progress, you know, myself and a couple of friends started talking about the possibility of steroids. But, you know, I was the kind of person where I, I wanted to understand about it. They were right. You know, we just got off the, uh, you know, the Ben Johnson scandal. and So this was uh, in the 80s. Yeah, I mean, well, my use was right in the early 90s. But, you know, from the time I think you had the Ben Johnson scandal to the time that they criminalized steroids and, you know, right at the time that I was using, started using them, um, it was just such a heavy media subject. And I just wanted to really delve in it. And um, the, the big thing for me is I, I read this book from, from this guy, Dan Duchesne, and he just had this completely contrary opinion on uh, anabolic steroids, you know, compared to what I was reading in the, uh, you know, in the newspapers and seeing on TV. The message that I was getting was, 
use these drugs, they'll build muscle, but they very likely could kill you. And, uh, you know, I was very scared of that fact and certainly didn't want to use something that would kill me, but I, I wanted to look into it more. And then I, I read this book and completely different side from, from what I was, what I was, uh, you know, hearing on the other end and, and eventually got into to using them and, um, and realized that, uh, I mean, I could go on and on about, uh, you know, the safety and effects of these drugs. They certainly have their risks, but, of course, they're also terribly misrepresented in the, in the media very often. So so were they effective? Did they, did you attain the goals, for <laughs> yeah. performance goals you had? For, for me, I think at the time. You know, when I first uh, got into it and I was young, I had, you know, dreams of getting on stage with, uh, you know, with the greats and being, a you know, a, a big competitive bodybuilder. But pretty quickly I realized that, um, and that's the thing. You can use as much drugs as you as you want. You need the genetics. You need the focus and the attention um, and the dedication. You need to have a whole lot of things to come into play to be a great athlete. Um, steroids don't make um, you know an athlete great, but they do make great athletes competitive. Uh, you know, uh, on a playing field where you know most great competitors are using them. And so, did you notice gains in muscle mass and things? Uh, maybe not to the point that you were could compete, but you you did notice that they worked. Yeah, absolutely. You know, the first cycle I did, and granted, a lot of it was water weight that I was holding, but I put on nearly 30 pounds. So I went from a skinny kid to, in the course of a couple of months, it was just like, what happened? You know, everybody knew I was using drugs and I was on steroids, but I loved it. I was just, I went from struggling in the gym, getting nowhere, you know, eking in a pound here or a pound there, to just dramatic progress. And, you know... And was this was was this on large doses or just a moderate dose? What what, what uh, chemical in particular were you using at the time? Well, I was using a very strong steroid. It was uh, anadrol oxymethylone. It's, it's an oral steroid. It's one of the strongest ones uh, that are available, but it wasn't on a very high dose. The thing about um, anabolic steroids is the first time, the first couple times you use them, they tend to be really really effective because you're you're introducing a level of hormone in your body that you, your body's never seen before. So you, you put on a lot of weight very quickly, but then you, you start to catch up. You, you can't grow indefinitely. The thing with competitive bodybuilding that makes steroid you know, abuse most extreme in this field is that you're constantly striving to put on more muscle, get bigger and bigger, and it's very difficult. Your body will constantly run into into walls where you, you know, you have to do new things with drug usage, your diet or your training and, and keep pushing forward. So, um, in that particular area, it's, uh, you know, that's where we certainly see the highest usage for that. But in the beginning, it was, yeah, it was very quick and, uh, and a lot of gains. And, and then did the gains fade after you discontinued? <laughs> well, the, the thing use? with the, the anadrol was I was holding a lot of water. So I think I lost about half the weight, you know, right away because it was, you know, it was the water that I was holding when I got off it. But I had still held, you know, 15, you know, maybe close to 20 pounds or something uh, of muscle. And within, you know, I got off it and pretty soon I said, oh, I'm going to give this another try and and go on it again. And, you know, it continued to make progress, but it was never like it was the first, uh, you know, the first time. Bill, we've got a quick two-minute commercial break. Can you stay with us for for another segment here? Absolutely. Um, We're talking to Bill Llewellyn, an expert on anabolic steroid use and, uh, and their use in in bodybuilding. And we'll be back in just a moment. Two-minute commercial break. Steve Reinhardt back in session here for Utah Go Green Carpet Cleaning. While the holiday season is already upon us, and there's never been a better time to get your home or business in order with freshly clean carpets by Utah Go Green Carpet Cleaning. Trust your carpeting to the experts at Utah Go Green Carpet Cleaning. For a limited time, they're offering a great deal on carpet cleaning. They will clean your three-bedroom home for only $149.99 using their low-moisture carpet cleaning system, which includes stairs, landings, hallways, bedrooms, and living areas. Once again, only $149.99. What a great deal. To schedule an appointment or a no-cost estimate, call 801-808-3228. That's 801-808-3228 or on the web at Utah Go Green Carpet Cleaning. Com. Call now and take advantage of these great savings. Once again, 801-808-3228. Some restrictions apply. Call for details. Hey, Dad. I passed my driving test. Nice license. Shows off the facial hair, right? <laughs> facial hair. Anyway, Dad... 
I think it's time I had my own car. Couldn't agree more. Really? Let me just grab the laptop and hit up Dexnose.com. Let's see here. Used cars? No credit necessary. Perfect. Whoa, sweet ride. How did you do that? With Dex. When you need something here and you need it now, you got to Dex it. So let's use Dex to find you. Hey, I'm Mike. Nice facial hair, kid. Who's he? Top-rated mechanic. The way you drive, you'll need one. Good call. Hey, Mike, you need any help in the front office? You need a job? No, but my son does. I do. How else are you going to pay for all of this? Oh. Need something local and need it now? Find it with Dex in the book at DexKnows.com or on your mobile phone. You'll get the sharpest local info, reviews, and advice fast. Dex, results for the here and now. Welcome back. I'm Steve Reinhardt. I'm your host. You're with KTalk AM 630, bringing you perspective on culture, history, politics, and religion, telling you everything you never knew you wanted to know. I mentioned earlier in the show that we had on uh, Larry Scott, Mr. Universe, Mr. Olympia, with us a few weeks ago talking about bodybuilding. It's a subject a lot of people are interested in. And I have Bill Llewellyn on with us. He's the author of an authoritative book on this subject, which is well known among bodybuilders, called Anabolics. It talks about anabolic steroids, their effect on the body, the differences between them. Bodybuilders are a fan of this book. And we may take some calls a little later in the show. If you feel like giving us a call, 254-5855 is the number. For, in Provo, 470-5855, Ogden, 670 Bill, I apologize for that commercial break. These things pop up on us from time to time. Oh, that's okay. No problem. Well, you're very honest about the fact that you used these in the early 90s. And after that, you it sounds like you became more interested in the academics uh, surrounding steroid use. What prompted you to write this book, Anabolics? Well, you know, what... what... The big issue that you had when you criminalized the possession of steroids and you um, passed laws that, you know, would, would remove doctor's licenses if they prescribed them for athletic purposes, and there was essentially this blackout in the medical community on anabolic steroids. So mm-hmm. when I was coming in starting to learn about them, I was really having to dig through old research. You couldn't, you know, you couldn't go to a physician anymore and get advice on, uh, on your steroid use. You couldn't get a prescription for steroid use. You couldn't be, you know, really monitored. It would be really facilitating drug use. So you went from a period in the 80s where if you were inclined, you could work with a physician. You could do things with with greater safety, make sure your health was monitored while you're using these drugs because in the short term, they actually are very safe. Um, steroids really become dangerous when you abuse them long term with the cardiovascular system. But And, and, you know, and what is long term, six months, six years? Years of use, really. Um, you know, that's the thing. That's why you don't see. Look, steroid use is pervasive in all love levels, especially top level, levels of sport. When I go to our trade shows and, and what have you, I speak with athletes that every type of athlete. I'm, I'm talking even like, you know, tennis players, um, you know, Olympics, uh, you know, body. Just about every sport you can imagine where strength or speed or endurance is involved, you have people using these drugs. And there's a reason why you don't just see people dropping dead left and right from steroid use. It's that acutely they're very safe. You can't overdose on anabolic steroids. You don't really take them and just drop dead. There is an extremely minuscule chance that you could, on certain steroids, damage your liver and have liver cancer. But the number of documented cases is, I believe it's still under 10. And in healthy athletes, with that happening, it's like a couple. It's it's very small. Now, granted, you, you there is issues with it, but by and large, what I see being around these drugs, you know, now my whole professional life is that I don't see people, you know, getting really sick and dropping dead from using them in the short term, but you have guys that are, you know, have been making a, a bodybuilding lifestyle out of steroid abuse. So now they're in their, you know, 40s, 50s, getting, you know, serious cardiovascular issues. And it's, it's very difficult to say, yeah, you know, you use steroids, you know, this number of years, now you have, you know, heart disease. It's difficult to make the association, but we do understand what it, they do to your body and that it should, in, you know, incline your body to, to heart disease. So, you know, so these are the issues, long-term safety. So I wanted to come in and at the very least try to educate people, give them, a, you know, a resource because some drugs are much more harmful than others. Some drugs are not uh, toxic to your liver at all. Some are a, a lot milder in terms of what they do to your cholesterol and, you know, how they alter it. And, uh, and of course, there's, you know, different ways to use them. And I'm certainly not trying to be out there and be an advocate of steroid use. I'm not trying to say, hey, you know, you want to compete, come use steroids. This is the way to do them. But I understand that millions of people out there are going to use anabolic steroids. 
They need a, a reliable resource to to become educated on them. And you just can't go to your physician anymore and say, hey, uh, you know, I'm thinking about steroids. Can you work with me on a program? They'll, they'll kick you out of the office. You're, you're on your own. So no. I'm the best I can to help. You, you just said millions of people are taking them. Is, is that true? Are there really millions of people taking these? Absolutely. Absolutely. What, what percentage of college athletes would you say are taking steroids? You know, it's difficult to say. I'd have to sit down and go through some, uh, some figures because they do uh, do some you know, surveys and what have you from time to time. Um, off the top of my head, I, I can't give you a number, but I can tell you that the more competitive the sport, the more competitive the division, the more money, the more promise there is, the more money, you know, the, the more you're going to see people inclined to do that because there's more at stake. Um, and, again, it's, a, it's an all sports. Uh, there's, so, there's very few sports. I haven't yeah, spoke with somebody using that, them in golf. I talk to golfers that use steroids. You wouldn't think it. Jeez. So that being the case, would, would, would you say most Olympic athletes are on steroids? It's very. I hate to say that because it's a very controversial thing, but I, I would just say this, say this. I, I'm. I would not be surprised. I'm never surprised when an Olympic athlete gets caught for steroids or, or other performance enhancing drugs. At that level of competition, I think um, you, you certainly have the the most reward, the most inclination to uh, to be competitive and to use drugs. Would I say the majority of them? It's difficult to, to, to put a number on it. Probably depends on the sport, but in a lot of them, absolutely. And if they're not, you gotta remember, you gotta remember too, you know, you, you don't build an athlete on a day of competition. You know, in a lot of sports, the Olympics is tough with off, off season competition, but in a lot of sports, you come in, you have, you know, when you have a drug test, you build the muscle, you put on the performance, you do a lot of that in the off season. So you tell, you tell me any sport where there's money, where it's really competitive and, you know, strength and speed or endurance are an issue and they're not doing a lot of testing for you on the off season, I would be surprised if there's a lot of people on there that aren't, uh, that aren't doing it because it's just such a, you know, such a competitive advantage. Well, where these drugs are controlled substances, they're, they're, regu- they're controlled the same way as heroin or cocaine or some of these other things, if I'm not mistaken. Mm-hmm. How are they so pervasive? Aren't, aren't these athletes taking a risk by getting involved in their use, don't they risk legal problems? Does the DEA enforce the steroid laws? Absolutely. And that, that to me is really, look, I'm a realist when it comes to drug policy. I, I think a lot of people want to look at the ideal. Hey, people are abusing steroids. We want to get rid of it. Let's make it illegal. It's going to go away. That, that's the ideal, but that's not the reality. You have to look at the reality. The reality is you've removed it from the physician. You've really lock down the legitimate market for anabolic stars in this country. There's really not much legitimate diversion anymore. So what happens? Uh, all the athletes are using drugs on their own without guidance. The drugs that they're getting didn't originate in pharmacies anymore and, in, and from drug companies. Uh, at the present time, the vast majority of everything is made in the underground. People put them together in their homes. The raw materials come from overseas, from unlicensed suppliers. I don't want to say it's gross, terrible market, but there's a lot of problems. It's not a pure, um, you know, sterile, you know, uh, drug market anymore. I mean, you, if for, for decades, all the drugs that were sold on the black market, for the most part, they came from pharmacies. It's not that way anymore. So that, to me, is the biggest concern. If, if I were a parent with a child in a sport, I wouldn't want them using anabolic steroids. But if I had a choice between them using anabolic steroids or getting arrested for, you know, for anabolic steroids, making them illegal, I would much prefer dealing with, you know, my child and explaining steroids to them than having to bail them out of prison or and getting them in the legal justice system. I mean, and that's an issue. And then, of course, the drugs that they're using today are not pharmaceutical drugs anymore. So to me, if, if, I, had, if I could wave a wand and fix it, I would say, look, people are going to use steroids anyway. At least put it back in the hands of the doctors. Don't suspend the doctor's license for, for treating an athlete that's using steroids, for prescribing them, for doing the right thing with them. If they're, if they're administering drugs to people that are in very poor health and, and they shouldn't be taking them, hold them accountable. But, you know, to me that's a much better solution than just this, this black market because criminalizing them hasn't stopped it. It's become more popular ever since. So. And, and so the black market exists in the United States. These are, for the most part, being manufactured here and yep. distributed here, you say, with raw materials from overseas. So there must be a huge amount of these these labs 
Absolutely, yeah. The the whole dynamic has changed, really. It's all underground driven now. Um, you know, it used to be, you know, you have a, a product, uh, you know, a drug company, Seba Dianabol, you know, testosterone from Upjohn. You, you knew these brands. They were drug companies when you, that you bought them on the black market. When I bought drugs when I was a young person, they came right from the local pharmacy out the back door, but they were pharmacy drugs. Now it's, you don't even really recognize the brands anymore. It's the local dealer gets the powder imported, prints up small labels and bottles it up in the kitchen and sells it. And, you know, some people are skilled at what they do. They buy good materials. Other people aren't very skilled and put out, you know, bad product. There's a lot more infections and a lot more issues right now that's caused by the, you know, the prohibition. So. And, are, and are they being distributed through the same channels, using the same dealers as other illicit substances? More and more, yes. That's another thing that happened because, you know, in the, in the 80s when it, – it, look, it's been illegal to deal in pharmacy drugs for as long as they've been prescriptions. But when they weren't – it wasn't a DEA issue. It was an FCA issue. You know, the, the trading was mostly by, you know, by bodybuilders, all levels of trading, even the big level trading. It was people that used the drugs, had access to them, sold them for the most part. The more – you know, once they became controlled substances and the diversion stopped, at uh, the pharmacy level, then, you know, you had a lot more uh, criminal element. They're importing, they're smuggling them in from other countries where they're, you know, more freely available. We're one of the only countries that use anabolic steroids, by the way, is this, you know, really strict criminal issue. In many other countries, there's no penalty at all for, for even in Canada, there's no penalty for possessing and using steroids. So, um, so now you have smugglers bringing them in and, you know, it's, it's certainly a, you know, a stronger criminal element. And, and it's not yet as bad as I think it's going to get. I think it's going to get a lot worse in terms of the quality. Well, so what do you see for the future? Will it continue to be a growing problem? Will eventually the laws be changed here in the United States, decriminalized to some extent, this type of thing? You know, it's difficult to say. If you asked me a year ago, I would have just said, look, uh, nothing's going to change for, in my lifetime. It's too small of an issue. For those that understand steroids, they understand, look, they, re they really don't fit the category of, of other narcotics. They really shouldn't be so, um, so illegal. So, you know, a year ago, I would have said, look, it's too small of an issue. Uh, but I think things are changing. I mean, look what happened this last election. We had two states that have essentially refuted the, um, the prohibition of cannabis that have said, look, that these, these criminal policies are worse than dealing with the issue itself. So, Perhaps I'm a little bit more optimistic that things would change. I don't know. I just I strongly believe believe being around the issue so much, um, you know, my my professional life that it's just when somebody gets caught up in the legal justice system for steroids, I just it's I, I don't see, ever see that as an advantage. I don't see it as wow these these people come in they get they get arrested they get clean their lives are saved. It's it's not an issue like that. Um, it's an issue where you have people that aren't doing anything wrong except trying to build their bodies, and they're using this drug to do it. And now suddenly you have, um, you know, kids, husbands, fathers that are caught up in this legal nightmare and often dealing with the criminal justice system that doesn't understand steroids at all. And you could get somebody that's sympathetic or somebody that views you like you're a heroin addict just because just they just don't understand it. And what are the typical penalties, and how is someone generally discovered does the dea have sting operations out there or are they they, they do a lot of different things a, a lot of people import from you know from the mail so they get caught you know getting stuff in the mail or there's so many ways that somebody gets caught and i've heard stories that you know a good person that you should try to get on at some point would be rick collins who who deals with uh, you know defense uh, with, with criminal uh, you know issues on steroids and he has some crazy stories but it's all over the place i mean you have people that will get arrested um, you know, the, the judge and, and, and the, the, the legal justice system in general, the prosecutors, will, all right, we'll go easy, we'll, we'll cut you a deal and, you know, no jail time served. And then you have just ridiculous stories with somebody getting caught with a personal use amount and serving, you know, real time for it. And that's the last thing I would ever want to see is, you know, some 19-year-old, 20-year-old kid um, in college, you know, working, uh, you know, hard at their sport gets caught up using steroids, and then that's it. You know, their life is changed forever because they get arrested, and it's just, to me, it's not the way to, to deal with this. But eh, there's different perspectives. So I understand that. So here's a, a brief list of people who've admitted using steroids. Arnold Schwarzenegger, Sylvester Stallone, Hulk Hogan. These are just the main ones, and, and there's all kinds of Olympic athletes that have been caught with them. Arnold Schwarzenegger did have bypass surgery or a heart valve replaced, do you think that was related to steroid use? 
You so, know, I'm not, I'm not extremely familiar with his uh, medical situation, so I'm not going to comment on that. But I would say, you know, the tough thing is on a case-by-case basis, you know, is one, you know, men, I mean, look, heart, it, heart disease is an issue in this country, you know, a big prevalent problem. Um, men, you know, we tend to have issues with it. It's possible. It could have just been, you know, something that happened because of diet, genetics, or what have you. Or, you know, star use could have contributed to it. Look, this is what stars essentially do that's bad for your body. You take them, they mess with your cholesterol. Sometimes they mess with your blood pressure, stuff like that. But the real, the long-term issue is they mess with your cholesterol. They tend to suppress your good cholesterol, sometimes really, really low. They tend to raise your bad cholesterol. Um, so you could have, you know, maybe, you know, a healthy person, you know, somebody's got two and a half, three to one ratio or something, um, bad to, uh, to good. Then suddenly they're, um, you know, they're using a lot of steroids. Now their HDL, their good cholesterol is, you know, nine. Their bad cholesterol is 200. Bill, Bill yep. can you stay with us for just another two minutes? We just got one final commercial break, and uh, I just had two follow-up questions for you. And uh, would that be all right? Yeah, absolutely. Great. Quick two-minute commercial break. This is Steve Reinhardt. You're with K Talk AM630. You're talking to Bill Llewellyn, an expert on anabolic steroids. Back in just a moment. Our family recently went through a move. If you or anyone you know is planning to move, let me give you a money-saving tip. Call Seven Brothers Moving. They're fantastic. I didn't know this until after they moved us. They are the in-state moving specialist, and they're the only get butter approved movers in the state. What I like most, next to their low prices, is the fact that they are a family-owned business. I checked out some of the companies that sounded local, but I found they were all nationwide franchise operations with high rates and low service. When Seven Brothers arrived, the first thing they did was remove the doors and pad the door jams. I had never seen that before. They were fast, efficient, very professional. When you look them up, remember, it's the number seven. SevenBrothersMoving.com. That's the number seven, BrothersMoving.com. Call 801-804-6779. That's 801-804-6779. Mention K-Talk. They'll take $50 off the price whether you're moving across state or next door. 801-804-6779. Turn your gold into cash. Come to the free gold party this Saturday at the Downtown Courtyard Marriott, 11 a.m. to 6 p.m. Bring your friends, family, and any precious metals you'd like to turn into cash. Get cash on the spot. Sell $150 of your gold and get a free $20 gas card and a chance to win $500. Plus, anyone who comes will get a free 30-minute massage from the Meekin Wellness Center. You don't want to miss this. Come to the free gold party. This Saturday, 11 a.m. to 6 p.m. at the Downtown Courtyard Marriott, 130 West, 4th South. Bring your unwanted, outdated, broken jewelry and receive top dollar on the spot. You can host your very own party, too. For more information, call 855-735-4313 or visit thegoldcycle.com. That's thegoldcycle.com. 855-735-4313. Turn your gold into cash. Come to the free gold party this Saturday at the Downtown Courtyard Marriott, 11 a.m. to 6 p.m. Don't miss it. Welcome back. Steve Reinhardt here. 20 minutes to the top of the hour. You're with K-Talk, AM 630. Happy to be with you on this snowy Saturday here in the state of Utah. I'm towing a boat through this. <laughs> Got to figure out how to get it around. We're talking to Bill Llewellyn, and he is the author of a popular book among the bodybuilding world called Anabolics. Bill's an expert on anabolic steroid use, its prevalence, its dangers. And let's go back to Bill now. Bill, thanks for being on with us. I, uh, I'm keeping you longer than I promised that I would, but I appreciate oh, okay. you, you answering okay. these questions. So what would you tell a kid who's in high school, who wants to be a big athlete, and who's convinced that he has to use anabolic steroids to achieve his performance objectives? I guess one question, which I which may be a legitimate question is, is he right? Does he have to? And how would you respond to that question? You know, it's really touchy. I mean, first off, um, you know, any, if you're talking about somebody that's in high school, you still have a lot of physical development to go to, you go through. You haven't reached your peak yet. So the first thing that I say to any, you know, high school kid that contacts me, and I never recommend, you know, somebody use steroids anyway. I always try to just give them the information to make the decision themselves. But, you know, Somebody at that age, I would say, look, you know, you have several years to go still where you, you, you still have to reach your natural potential. 
if you are going to consider using, you know, these drugs, the time to consider using them, if, if you know, that's something you really want to do, if you have a competitive future, you know, the, the, somebody's coming to you, look, this, this is a real serious path for you, we need to talk about this. The time to do that is, one, when you have a serious direction to go in, and two, when you've maxed out your natural potential. Um, I don't really view steroids as something that anybody should use as a shortcut to get to your natural potential faster. I confess I did it myself probably like that as a kid, but, um, you know, with, with a little bit, uh, you know, more hindsight now and a little bit more wisdom, I think, in my age, I always recommend to everybody, you know, look, it's a decision you make if you have to make it. It's not one you, you rush into, and it's certainly not one that I think, uh, you know, most high school uh, level um, you know, athletes need to be considering. And but, you know, Okay, I'm sorry, go ahead. But I was going to say you, you raised a good point, you know, can somebody be a top level competitive, you know, bodybuilder, top level sprinter, top level real athlete without using drugs? I think some people have got there without using drugs, but I think more probably have used them to get there. It's, it's a tough, it's a tough subject. Well, so when you look at these these bodybuilders in the national competitions, are there any of them that are that are actually natural, or are they all on steroids? Uh, I mean, I, I really can't answer that. Um, you know, my understanding is in. In the most popular competitions, they don't drug test, so, and, and so you can do with that what you what you want. Right, and and I I understand that they are basically all all using them in the Arnold Classic, Mr. Universe, Mr. Olympia. That it's just so prevalent uh, that there, there's not not even uh, an exception. Yeah, um, yeah, what is bodybuilding? That's the you know that represents the extreme of muscle building. You know the extreme of body transformation. Um, these are the tools for that. It's really difficult to have, you know, a competitive, and there are natural competitive associations of test, um, and mm -hmm. I'll give them a lot of credit for that. Like um, NGA is one, and uh, they run a local competition here. But if you look at the pictures of their bodybuilders, they don't they don't look anything like the the bodybuilders in the larger competitions. Of course, you know what's funny too, if you look back and you watch some, of, you look at some of the old bodybuilding competitions um, from years back before steroids were. A prominent issue. And, you, you see a stark difference. When did steroids become? When were they introduced into the bodybuilding scene? Really, the '60s. I mean, they came on the scene in athletics in the late '50s. Really, um, '60s is when they started really eking out. And by the '70s and '80s, it was you know it was very, getting very popular in those circles, without a doubt. Once you got the Ben Johnson and, and the public attention to it, then it started spilling over more and more to non-competitive athletes, recreational athletes and bodybuilders. Even some athletes like Carl Lewis tested positive for steroids when he was in the Olympics. Was I, Isn't that right? I believe he was tested positive for, I want to say it was a level of, a, wasn't it a ephedrine or ephedra that um, at present, I think at present level it would have been passable at the time it would have, but yeah, this look, there's politics in sports, yeah. <laughs> without a doubt. I'm, I'm not going to lie to you. There's, there's a lot of politics in sports. I can't comment on that. I wasn't around for that, and um, I don't know the exact specifics of it. But, um, but without a doubt, there's. Well, listen, Bill. Thank you for coming on on such short notice, and thank you for taking the time with us here to answer these questions. I found your book interesting. I think you're you've become the expert on this subject, <laughs> for, for better or worse. Thank and you. I, I it, appreciate it. And I encourage. Our listeners who are interested in in this subject to uh, read your book, Anabolics, and you've got a website as well where people can go find out information. What is that website? Uh, MN, uh, as in uh, Michael Nancy, MN Body, uh, my company's molecular nutrition, uh, mnbody.com. And, you know, I do want to add one thing, really tiny thing real quick. Sure, yeah. When I gave it. you those cholesterol numbers before, you know, those represent an extreme and, uh, mm -hmm. you know, I, I guess an, an abusive use and, and use that, you know, that should be corrected. But that's one of the things that I try to do with my book is, not all steroid use has to be so, you know, risky to your health, and, and you can approach it with a much safer, um, you know, in a much safer manner. So that's really what I'm trying to do is just give people the tools to first decide really if that's what they want to do, and then if they're going to do that, you know, do it at least with some, you know, some being informed and making, you know, somewhat better decisions and just going into it blindly with no advice. Well, thank you again for coming on, Bill, and... I really appreciate you coming on. Yeah, thanks for having me. Uh, anytime. Thank. Have a great weekend. You too. Good I luck with your boat. I want to go now to some issues of culture, history, politics, and religion in the news. 
and for those of you, our listeners, who want to hear that interview again, we'll post it on the website, ktalk, k-talk.com. A lot of interesting things going on, and we don't have as much time left in the show as I would like. The U.S. Supreme Court has agreed to take up the gay marriage debate. This whole Proposition 8 thing going on in California, they're going to hear it. To give you a quick review, Proposition 8 was ballot made, an effort to ban gay marriage in California. It passed, some people believe, with, with the support of the LDS Church. The LDS Church made the difference. I think it passed by 56% in California, which was a surprise because people view California as this liberal place, banning gay marriage in the state. It actually amended the California Constitution to prohibit gay marriage. Well, the states, like the federal government, have constitutions. The state of California has a constitution. The U.S. government, of course, we have a constitution. The state of Utah has a constitution. Some issues are left to the states to decide. Some issues are left to the federal government to decide. Is gay marriage, or whether people of the same gender can marry it, an issue for the states of the federal government? Well, the answer is that it's an issue for the federal government because the federal government has made it that way. They have passed a statute prohibiting gay marriage, and the states are prevented from passing their own statutes that, or enforcing statutes that contradict federal laws, the doctrine of preemption. Nevertheless, you've got states doing it. You have states that have just legalized marijuana. The federal government has illegalized marijuana. These laws stand in contradiction to federal law. The federal government can still go into these states, even the states that have legalized marijuana, and arrest people for having, you know, being in possession of marijuana. And Obama has indicated that he's not going to enforce the law in those states. He's not going to have the federal government enforce those laws. So he's, in some sense, ceding the, this power to the states without actually overturning the law that's on the books. So it's the president overturning Congress unofficially without any power to do so. He's doing the same thing when it comes to immigration. But the Supreme Court is going to take up the gay marriage issue now. Proposition 8, the amendment to the California Constitution, was heard by a federal judge in the Ninth Circuit who ruled that it was unconstitutional because the attempt by the state of California to amend its constitution to prohibit gay marriage was unconstitutional under the U.S. Constitution, which this judge thought allows or mandates. Well, how can this possibly be? Nowhere does the U.S. Constitution say that gay marriage is okay. Well, what the judge says is that the U.S. Constitution has an equal protection clause and that this equal protection clause extends to, to gay marriage and that it, the state of California cannot enact an amendment to its own constitution which contradicts the U.S. Constitution. It turns this federal judge who did this, who ruled this way, is himself gay. Now, is that right for a federal judge who's gay to be ruling on this issue? And I don't know if that's one of the issues in, ap in the appeal or not that's going to the U.S. Supreme Court, whether this judge ought to have recused himself. I would imagine it's not one of the issues. The United States is divided up into federal circuits. The Utah sits in the 10th circuit. Now, I think there are 11 circuits plus what's called the federal circuit, which handles intellectual property matters. So you've got 11 or 12 circuits here in the United States. Most circuits have a multitude of states within them. Utah, Idaho, Colorado, Arizona are all, not Arizona, excuse me, Wyoming, uh, we're all in the 10th. The 9th covers basically California. And the circuits have different reputations. The 9th circuit is thought to be the most liberal, progressive, if you want to use that word, basically hippie, crazy circuit that exists. So much so that judges in the other circuits often view rulings coming out of the Ninth Circuit with great suspicion. They even view justices and judges in the Ninth Circuit as, as, as something of idiots. And I can tell you, one of those people was my law professor, Ronald Boyce, <laughs> at the University of Utah. He hated cases from the Ninth Circuit. At his funeral, there was an anecdote, a story told, about him standing up in courtroom. He was a magistrate, a federal magistrate, and yelling at an attorney who was trying to cite Ninth Circuit authority and yelling at him, asking him, do you see palm trees outside? Do you smell marijuana in the air? Does this look like the Ninth Circuit to you? Anyway, these rulings in the Ninth Circuit don't go over very well with certain people, including certain judges. And there is a justice on the Court of Appeals in the Ninth Circuit named Stephen Reinhardt. He's got the same name as me. 
and he's the worst one out there, the most liberal. I've been asked on a couple of occasions if I'm related to him. So the Ninth Circuit rules that California's ban on gay marriage is unconstitutional. It's now going to the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court's going to come down on, and decide this issue. We have a situation where the federal government's passed a law saying gay marriage is legal. The state has passed a law saying gay marriage is legal. Gay marriage has always been illegal in this country. What is the Supreme Court going to do? Well, it's hard to say, but some people can come to certain conclusions about it. I, there's no doubt in my mind that the Supreme Court is swayed by politics, by political pressures. There are four members of the Supreme Court who are total liberals, and I think it's become more liberal recently. I mean, you've had liberals on there for a while, Ruth Bader Ginsburg especially, but you now you've got Sotomayor, you've got Elaine Kagan, you've got you know all these people. And they are swayed by politics. Ironically, the judicial system was created supposedly with safeguards in place to prevent judges from being swayed by politics. But they are. The law is that the Constitution does not provide protection for gay marriage. But you nevertheless may have the Supreme Court rule that it does because there's pressure on them to rule that way. And the justices want to be looked at as civil rights heroes. They think there's a trend in the country towards legalizing gay marriage and so they want people to look back on them fondly as having been above the trend, ahead of it. My guess is we will have a split 5-4 decision on the issue, and I don't know which way the 5-4 decision is going to go. But we'll see. We should have that, imagine, next year sometime, that decision. We don't have a ton of time left in the, in the show today. A few other issues I wanted to get into, but we will cover those next week here on KTOC, AM 630, Voice of Utah, Utah's oldest continuing broadcasting radio station. Happy to be with you for this brief one-hour period. Snow's on the way. Enjoy yourselves this weekend. I'm signing off.